record these. Okay. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time we can be together. Thank you so much for the ones who's come out tonight and uh, just kind of battling weather and still still coming out. And we just thank you for each of them. Please bless the evening. And uh, we just thank you for letting all things work to good to your glory. And for those that just need a special touch tonight, may some word just touch their heart that will give them the encouragement and the healing the joy, the peace, the comfort, whatever it is they need, that it may minister to them personally. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so what's the difference? Chapter 5, taken from Fritz Rittenauer's um, book here. So what's the difference? Okay, uh, chapter 5, that might be a little hard to read. I was trying to find a good font for this color here, but so much color is in this picture. Uh, but it says, uh, Islam, Allah is one, and they believe Christ was just a prophet. Now, with this, uh, it's very interesting. You will hear this a lot in many, many religions. Very few religions, it seems like, are they going to say uh, Jesus was uh, a total fake? He was, you know, just made up, whatever. And you'll hear individual people say that, but as far as religions go, if they mention him, it's usually he was a good prophet. And I find that very, very interesting because uh, I was thinking of the verse here, Deuteronomy 18, 21 to 22. So let's see what the characteristics of a prophet is. You may say in your heart, Moses is talking, you may say in your heart, how will we know uh, what... How, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? In other words, how do we know when a prophet is speaking or not? So he goes on and says, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. In other words, if someone is claiming to be a prophet and they speak something and it doesn't happen, then just write them off. So when you kind of think about it, how can a religion call Jesus a prophet when number one, he says, I am God. I was here before the creator of the earth. I am the one and only. I will die for the sins of the world. I will raise again. I'm going to come and take you back. Okay, if you don't believe that, then how can he be a prophet? Because he's either telling the truth, he's lying, or he's a lunatic, right? I mean, it can't be both. And so when you hear religions suddenly just say, well, Jesus was only a prophet. But how can he be a prophet? And he's saying all these things about himself. And if you're not believing it, then you can't say that he's really a prophet. So to me, that's a red flag in biblical Christianity. When someone says, oh, he was only a good prophet, but he really didn't mean everything he said. Now. Again, we go to our plumb line, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4. It says, Christ died for his sins, number one, according to the scriptures. He was buried, number two. He was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And that's kind of where, where uh, all of our sessions have been. That's going to be our, uh, our main timeline here, our plumb line. Now, I'm going to give you a lot of history today, okay? And so a lot of the Bible verses, because uh, I always want to use scripture, always want to try and back up what I say with scripture. And so we're going to use a lot of scripture a little bit later, but I'm going to give a lot of introduction about Islam because I think it's one of those religions that, you know, we hear all about. We all, we're hearing about it in the news. We, we hear about it and then you start saying, well, wait, we, we hear about Arabs, we hear about Islam, we hear, hear about, you know, Mohammed, we hear about, uh, uh, you know, all these terms and who are these people are actually, who are Muslims, who are Arabs, you know, so I want to get into that tonight, but Islam is the religion, so when you talk about Islam, okay, that's the religion, uh, and it, it can um, it, it also can incorporate a geopolitical ethnic group as well. But Islam, the religion, the people who believe in Islam has gained thousands of converts in North America and more and more, even uh, a whole lot more than when this book was actually written, uh, when Fritz Rittenauer wrote this book. Uh, it's the, it's the youngest among 
the major world religions, but yet at the same time, it's one of the largest. Okay. Gonna get off the screen. Okay. It's one of the youngest, but among major world religion, it's, believe it or not, again, one of the largest. And we hear this all the time. Now, as, uh, it's very missionary-minded, so much so that its goal is basically to convert Western countries, not just African and Asian countries. Okay? Its goal is basically to convert the world. It wants to be a worldwide dominant religion. So it's very, very missionary-minded in its, in its theology. It has approximately 1 billion followers in the countries throughout the world. So every one in six, one in every seven people in the world, you might say, uh, uh, believes in Islam. Now, Indonesia, the circle that I have here, that's Indonesia here on our map, kind of between uh, China and Australia, has the most Muslims of any country with about 120 million uh, converts. And so you can see it spreading. We tend to think, of Islam just being in the Middle East. No, it's, it's spread all down here, all throughout Indonesia. So it's got a tremendous influence here in the world. Well, I got one out of six, it's probably now, what are we, seven? One out of seven, probably now, you know, people in the world profess to be Muslim. And so it has spread very, very much. Uh, Islam originated in what is now Saudi Arabia. You can see on the screen here, I circled that. Saudi, and we'll talk about Mecca, the little red circle there. But it was a perfect trading route, as you can see, going along uh, the routes from between Africa and Asia. So it, whether the arrows are going left or the arrows are going right, um, if, if you went uh, uh, kind of through the Mediterranean Sea by that way, come down with your what is Suez, go down through the Red Sea, head over to Mecca, or even then go, go down farther into the Arabian Sea over into India, uh, it was a major trading point. So this became uh, a very large populated area. Now, the word Islam means submission, uh, submission, submission to Allah. And so that's where we get basically Islam. It means submission to Allah. Now, Muhammad, a little history here, Muhammad founded the religion Islam, and the believers of Islam are called Muslim, okay? So the believers of Islam is called Muslim, meaning one who lives his life according to God's will. So, so, so here we have, first of all, Islam is the religion, okay? Muslim would be the a person who believes in Islam, okay? Now, uh, you don't have the slide, okay? So in yellow, you don't have this. So don't be looking in your book here. Uh, I added it in. Those who follow the prophet's closest companion. Now you'll hear a lot of Sunni and Shia or Shia. Shiite, Shia is the same thing. You'll see kind of uh, uh, up here on the screens. Uh, they are the two predominant groups that make up uh, the Muslim population primarily. Now, when you hear uh, Sunni, those are the uh, Muslims that followed closest to the prophet's uh, companion, Abu uh, Bakr, and became known as Sunni. Okay, those who followed the prophet's closest companion was uh, who was Abu Bakr was a Sunni. Okay, now those who followed the prophet's cousin and son-in-law. Uh, Ali became known as Shia or Shiite. So what really the difference is between Sunnis and Shiites, they're more alike than probably differences. And the differences are probably more than anything, more geopolitical. The geography, uh, their area geographically in the world, okay, and their, their political stance. And so uh, the Sh Sh Sunnis, what they believed that the followers, they kind of believe in following the precepts and concepts of Muhammad, where the Shiites believe that the leader should be a descendant of the bloodline of Muhammad. So right there kind of uh, builds up a friction of who should be in charge. 
Well, Shiites would want to say it should be from the bloodline of Muhammad, where the Sunnis would say, no, it should be someone who just holds Islam very close and is going to adhere to their following. So you can see right away, that's going to cause some tensions. Then where they land up geographically, then there's going to be land grabs, power grabs, trying to get, you know, uh, uh, geography, more land. So as you can see, the Sunnis make up the most of the Islamic population. You can see almost the top half of North Africa, uh, where Turkey is, Syria, um, all down through there, Saudi Arabia, and then a good part of India, and all the way up to Kazakhstan. Where the Shiites, as you can see here, they're basically in, uh, in Iran. And, uh, and so remember the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, a lot of you probably remember that. Okay, so here, if I can get my pen going, um, th this right here was Iran, okay, I mean, Iraq, and th this was Iran over here. And so that war was between these two. It was basically between the Sunnis and the Shiites. And so that's where that war, uh, war came about. But again, the Shiites are uh, a much smaller group, but they adhere the strongest to uh, Muslim beliefs. And at, as far as punishments and things like this. Now, the Sunnis, uh, this is another one I don't think you have. The Sunnis focus, and this is what I just got you saying, the Sunnis focus on the prophet's example, living by his good word. So their leader would be not someone necessarily from the bloodline, but someone who follows the prophet's example, whereas the Shiite uh, focuses on the lineage of Muhammad's family, through a series of uh, imams, and uh, that is an uh, Islamic leadership. So they believe their leaders, again, should be basically be from the bloodline of Muhammad. So uh, as far as they both believe in Islam, they both ba basically believe in the main principles, they both believe in the Quran, but it's mainly geopolitical differences that has caused the conflicts. Who should be in charge? Who should be the ruler, basically, is what's happening here. Now, how Muhammad became a prophet. So let's go back a little bit. Muhammad was born in the Arabian city of Mecca, and I have that circled here on your map, in AD 570. So in the sixth century, he's born, and he came from a, a prominent and highly respected family. Now, Muhammad was raised primarily by his uncle, Abu Talib, Okay, who herded flocks. So he came from a prominent family, a wealthy family. And what's very interesting, I, I, as I was looking at this map, I had to stop and make some little arrows and marks, only because I like to make arrows and marks. But what, what is very interesting, I, uh, I kind of saw here, let me see if I can get my highlighter on this. Let me see it a little bit easier. Uh, th this, this region right in here, during the sixth, seventh century was, was really the, uh, the old Roman empire. And it was predominantly Christian. Okay, everything in the green here uh, is uh, Islam, okay? And then you have tiny little Israel uh, right in here, okay, Jewish. So the, by the sixth, seventh, eighth century, the map of the world was basically in three uh, religious uh, geopolitical groups. You have uh, uh, Asia, you've got uh, the Middle East, North Africa, and you have a little Israel right in the middle of that. And so this is one of the things we talk about biblical prophecy and apologetics or whatever. How has Israel been able to exist even at all during all of these years? And you take a look at this, and the effort it, it took, now granted, the um, Ottomans, eventually the Turks took over Israel, okay, but the Jewish people themselves had never been, in fact, that's what all the Crusades are about, is to get them out of the, the, the Turkish hands, uh, the, the, the Muslim hands. And so, uh, but still the Jewish people have always remained. They have never been wiped out. So you think, well, how did... You know, how does that happen other than the hand of God? And so uh, but then eventually uh, Islam is going to basically take over that whole region. That's kind of interesting when you see kind of those uh, three groups. Now, later in life, Muhammad got into a caravan trade 
and accompanied his uncle on trips to uh, Syria and Persia. And let me erase my markings here and we can see this a little bit better. Okay, so you see the arrows there. The arrow up to the left is going to Syria and the arrow go up to the right is Persia. So when you talk about Iraq, people in Iraq, they're Persians, okay? Uh, so we, we speak of them as, uh, as Persians. And so he would go, uh, uh, Iran, I, I meant Iran, sorry. I, Iran is the Persian. And so uh, he would go up to the right, he'd go up to the left. And so he he really started learning his geography, started learning uh, his, his outline, the lay of the land really, really well. And because of that, he started under getting mixing up with other religious groups, especially uh, Jewish groups. And then he's also mixing with Christian groups. Now, during the travels, Muhammad was exposed to several concepts of monotheism. That's a belief in one God, Christianity, Judaism, okay, belief in one God. And he was starting to pick up beliefs from uh, the Mane, Mane, the Manaphysites, the Manaphysites, that's what I'm trying to say, the Manaphysites, and also of the Nestorians. Now, the Manaphysites were those who believed that Christ, it's kind of, it's kind of hard to explain, but they believed that Christ had a divine nature and a human nature, kind of almost like you're split in half, one is divine and one is human. Uh, so like they were two, two separate natures. Were we in Christianity, we believe that Jesus was total um, human, he was total divine at the same time. Now, um, so, so there was... Uh, a, a different beliefs. So once, like I said, the Manaphysites, they kind of believe that Christ had only the one half, the divine nature, or he just was divine. The Nestorians kind of believed he was divided in half, had two different sides. We, as Christian believers, we believe that he was uh, all human, he was all divine as well. And and so so he started picking up these different ideas of this monotheism. So wh whether you know who Christ was, whatever, he started saying, "Well, th these people are saying there's one God." And so he starts getting this circulated into his mind as he's thinking about this. So I had another slide. You don't have this, by the way. When you see the words, you do not have this. It means you don't have it. Okay. So it's just kind of written in code. Okay. So now. Arab, getting into some more things, we have Islam, we have Muslim. Now, who are the Arabs? Who are the Muslims? Who are the Arabs? Okay, Arab is an ethno-linguistic category, identifying people who speak the Arabic language, not just from Saudi Arabia, necessarily, as their mother tongue, or in the case of immigrants, for example, whose parents or grandparents spoke Arabic, Arabic as their native language. There are 26 countries or territories in Western Asia and Africa where Arabic is the official or one of the official languages of the state. So if a person speaks Arabic, you can say they're Arab. So technically you can have a Muslim that is not Arab because they don't speak Arabic. You can have an Arab that's not Muslim because they don't believe in Islam, or you can have a person that's both Arab and Muslim, okay? So if that makes a whole lot of sense, We'll go on to the next slide, maybe one that you do have. <laughs> okay. So I know it can be real confusing. You think, man, I hear these, these words, you know, who are Arabs, who are uh, Muslims? Well, they can be one and the same, but Islam is the religion. Now, Muhammad was also exposed during his travels here in the caravan trade and different trading uh, expeditions he went on, was exposed to the Jewish teaching and was introduced to the Talmud. And we talked about that one last week, it's a 36 volumes of Jewish writings, okay, that uh, came after the Torah. Remember, the Torah was the first five books of the Old Testament. And so he's exposed to the Talmud, and of course, it's talking about uh, the J Jews, one God, this monotheistic type of thinking. Now, Muhammad did not appear uh, to have really a very good understanding or belief of the Jewish scriptures. Apparently, he was introduced the, to them, but didn't have a real grasp. After all, you know, the Talmud, 36 volumes, you know, and uh, how much even of the uh, Torah he actually knew, we're not sure. Uh, but it doesn't seem like he had a real good understanding or belief of the scriptures since these theological concepts 
are really not clearly stated in the Quran. Uh, that was developed by Muhammad. Muhammad is the one that came, developed the Quran, felt that God gave it to him. And so, so some of the things he writes, it does, it seems like he's kind of adding a little bit here and a little bit of their Judaism, but not really being quite theologically sound in the interpretation of Judaism. So at the age of 25, Muhammad married his employer, the wealthy widow named Hadija, or I've heard it pronounced Khadija, I suppose either one is right, uh, uh, who was 40 years of age. So he, he married her, and then after the marriage, I'm not sure if it was an age thing or what, he spent much of his time in solitary meditation <laughs> during the next 15 years. <laughs> we won't go there, okay? <laughs> And so he spends a lot of time in solitary thinking, meditation. And so as the time goes on, by the age of 40 now, Muhammad received his first revelation while contemplating in a cave on Mount Hira near Mecca. So we're going to see that this is not an unusual thing, getting a uh, secret interpretation by God. Now, again, one of the things that I, I like to make the comparison when we're studying other religions with biblical Christianity. In biblical Christianity, uh, our God of the Bible was always very open. Whenever God wanted to say something, he said it in the open. Now, granted, when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, Moses was by himself on the mountaintop. But that mountaintop completely exploded in fire. The earth completely shook. The people were terrified because they knew God's presence was there. That a pillar of fire by the, uh, for night, a cloud by day, they had walked through the parted Red Sea. So uh, they had all manna coming down from heaven, quail coming down, and all sorts of miracles, water coming out of a rock. God made himself very, very, very visible. So it wasn't like, uh, you know, Moses of the Bible getting a secret thing no one knows about it. Same thing with uh, Jesus' words. You know, Jesus didn't go in a cave and then come out with his words and give it to someone. He he did words and backed them up with physical miracles. I mean, literally, he raised the dead. He made the lame walk. He made the blind to see. He, he, he calmed the storm. He took a few small loaves of fish and bread and uh, fed thousands with it. He was doing miracles uh, after miracles of miracles. And then when he died on the cross, he didn't die alone or whatever. A whole group of people uh, saw it. I'll mention this a little bit later, but the, some of the dead were actually raised out of the graves. And so the Bible is not a secret thing. Um, and, and so whereby, you know, revelations are given secretly. Now, I know some of some, I think, aha, aha, how about Paul when he says, I went up to heaven and I got some, the third heaven, he calls it, which possibly was the uh, his death after his stoning on his first miss, missionary journey. Uh, and God gave him some revelations. Well, what about that? Well, the revelations weren't really anything new that uh, had is not really already in the Bible. For example, in uh, 1 Thessalonians and 1 Corinthians, when he talks about the rapture, that we will all not see death, but, you know, we're, uh, Christ will come down with a shout. We're going to instantly resurrect with him. Well, didn't Jesus say that, tell his disciples before his death, his death not to worry, not to fear, because I am going to come after you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to take you home. I'm preparing a place for you. So when I come and get you, you're going to be with me forever. That, uh, that I believe, was a very uh, thing about the rapture. Because when you read about the second coming and you read uh, read this in um, Zechariah and you, um, you read this in um, uh, Isaiah, um, I mean, Ezekiel 38, 39, uh, Jesus doesn't get the church in the air. Uh, we don't come to him at the end times in Revelation and um, Zechariah and uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39. Christ comes to us uh, on the earth, and he battles. He battles a war. And when you really study what the second coming is like, 
he comes to deliver Israel, okay? Because the whole nations of the world are coming in Armageddon to defeat Israel. And Christ comes on the Mount of Olives. He splits the thing uh, from the north to the south, right in half. He makes a way for the Jews to escape. And he, his, he lands his feet directly on the Mount of Olives. And he comes into Jerusalem. And he fights for Israel. Now, there's no place where suddenly a rapture is going to come down. And he's going to take the drive down to the Red Sea. Apparently. He, uh, it's... Uh, uh, it's two separate events. So, no, the Bible is open. It's, it's very, very clear um, when, uh, you know, God wants to get something across. There's that little hole there. That would be the problem. Okay. Well, that's that straight or whatever. Okay, someone's got their mic on. Uh, we can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, now. Okay. Yeah, here we go. Uh, Muhammad said, let's see, let me turn back a second. I'm getting right on this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Muhammad said the angel Gabriel came to him in a dream and brought him the following command of God. And again, uh, this is why I say what really is a difference of, uh, you know, many religions and biblical Christianity that it was done in the open. You know, there, there wasn't private conversations but he's saying that the angel Gabriel came to him. And this is what he said. And Muhammad didn't read or write. So whatever he said, he, he spoke and it was written down for him. And so it says, read in the name, the Lord says to him, he said, read in the name of the Lord, read in the name of thy Lord who created, who created man of blood coagulated. Read, the Lord is most beneficent who taught by the pen, taught that what they knew not unto men. Now, with this, from the command to read comes from, we get the word uh, Quran, which means reciting or the reading, okay? And so this is where we get the command, uh, I said the Quran, from the command to read from this revelation that Gabriel gave to Muhammad. Now, since Muhammad could not read or write, the Quran is, uh, is his uh, reciting of revelations. So people then wrote it down as he recited it or memorized it, then wrote it down later. And so really that's how the Quran comes about. Okay. Now, through encouragement, Muhammad then begins uh, began to preach in the streets and marketplaces in Mecca. You can see up here, I think on your map too, I've got a circle. You can see where Mecca is. And it was becoming a tremendous uh, tr trading uh, area. So in the 6th, 7th century, it was really uh, having a flow of trade. Now, Muhammad never proclaimed to be divine, but did believe Allah called him to be a prophet. So he, he claimed that he was a prophet. He's going to say, well, I was a prophet, just like other Old Testament prophets in the Jewish Bible were, and the uh, Christian Bible, just like Jesus was. He, Jesus was just only a prophet. But... Uh, Muslims believe that Muhammad was the greatest of them all. Now, Muhammad hated the idolatry and immorality of the Arabs who lived in Mecca and of those who came to trade their goods. And he was grieved over the treatment of the poor and was met by bitter opposition. Now, that's one thing they do really try and do is, you know, to really um, treat the poor. They try to be benevolent in their society. And he didn't like the immorality that he saw, which is a good thing. You can imagine anytime you have large trading cities, you know, look at our big cities here in the United States. Usually they have a lot of trouble and a lot, lot of mixing and ideas and just, you know, uh, and this is what he was seeing. So he starts speaking against it. Now, he got so many people angry with him that, on the date, July 16, uh, 622 AD, he was forced to flee to Yathra. Now it's called Medina. So if you see your map, the little arrow, he goes from Mecca to Medina. It was Yathra, but we call it Medina now. And this flight was called the Hegara okay, and marks the beginning of the Islamic calendar. Okay, so this is where Mecca comes in. This is where Medina comes in. He flees to Medina called the Hegara. And this marked now the beginning of the Islamic calendar. 
Now, Yathrib was eventually renamed Medina, and Muhammad became the religious and politi political leader of the city. So now not only is he uh, just a religious leader, he kind of becomes, he now becomes the head of this region of Medina, and he becomes now the political leader. Now, this again is, uh, compares with Chris, biblical Christianity and the fact that Christ really did the same thing, but he's going to do it at two different times. The first time he came to be the religious leader, the savior of the world, who died on the cross, gave himself for uh, our sins. But then he's going to come a second time as king of kings and lord of lords. And he's going to be then both religious and political. He's going to be the last world ruler. <laughs> now, after a fight between the Meccans and Muhammad and his followers, Muhammad entered Mecca. So he goes back to Mecca victorious, and he destroyed every idol in, uh, in uh, Kaaba, the main temple, Kaaba. Since that time, Kaaba has been the spot, you can see it here, toward which all devout Muslims direct their prayers. So he comes back again to Mecca, he enters it victorious, and he destroys every idol. So he becomes now uh, a war machine, you might say. When we get into Mormonism, you'll kind of see the same thing with Joseph Smith. He died in a gun battle, trying to be broken out of jail. And so, uh, no, Jesus didn't come uh, as a warrior, but he will to come as a warrior his second coming is when he lands he's going to fight for israel and he's going to just slaughter the invading armies that's circling and circling israel so he is going to do it but it's going to be a righteous judgment because during the tribulation everybody is going to be preach the gospel to the bible tells us that that the gospel will be preached to the ends of the world and then the end comes Okay, sometimes I think people misunderstand that that passage of scripture, thinking that today, if we can preach the gospel to everyone in the world, Jesus will come. No, it's really talking about end times. During the tribulation, the gospel is going to be spread to everybody. No one will have an excuse not to hear the gospel. And at that time, they're going to, uh, the Christ is going to come and he's going to be a judge because everyone's going to have had a chance to hear it. And then he will come and he's going to fight for Israel because Israel is going to be attacked. And the people who are surviving in Israel, they're all going to suddenly see him, recognize him, and believe in him. Those who aren't going to believe in him, the Jews, are they're going to be taken away. Okay, right during this time, a uh, big portion of the city is going to be taken away. But those who stay in Israel, they're all going to see him, repent, and believe. And so, yes, he will come as a warrior. But no, not the first time. Now, but he's going to be justified in that, okay? Because he's the ultimate supreme God of the universe, okay? So he can have judgment. Now, during the next two years, Muhammad became the leading prophet and ruler of Arabia. Muhammad united the tribes into vast army to conquer the world for Allah. Now, I, I kind of had to compare that with Jesus' first coming in Matthew 28. So what did he tell his disciples? How did he, they, how were they to, you might say, quote, conquer the world for Christ? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. How? By spears and uh, horses and mounted armies? No. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So again, as we do a comparative religion study, all we're doing is comparing how one religion spread it, how another one spreads it teaching them uh, to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So there's a real difference in the, how uh, uh, Muhammad was wanting the gospel spread as uh, opposed to how Christ wanted it spread. Now, Muhammad died in 632 AD, but his followers continued spreading the message of Islam. Now, the teachings of Islam. The Quran is the sacred scriptures of Islam. Okay, when you hear about the Quran, it's it's their Bible, you might say. Now, while the Quran is credited to God, Muhammad dictated part of it 
while the rest came from writings of disciples who remembered his oral teachings after he died. So some of them were, were directly given, and some of the Quran is written in from people who remembered some of the things he did, you know, after he died, whatever. And so it compiles, compiles the book. Okay. Now, Muslims believe the Quran is copied from the original in Arabic and now resides in heaven. Okay, you're going to see this is a, another common theme that happens often in other religions. The original one is no longer there. You know, well, you know, in biblical Christianity, we believe that the writings were meant for everyone. When Moses came down from the mountain, the tablets were written in stone, you know, so they could not be uh, ever done away with. And then um, when Jesus' words were written down, you know, they, they were written for all to see, all to read, you know, and transcribed and spread all around. So we don't feel that any words were, you know, taken up from earth and uh, being secretly held in heaven. Now, in addition to the uh, Quran, Muhammad developed teachings and sayings called Sunna or Sana. I've, I've heard it both ways as I was looking it up. Sana or Sunna, uh, meaning the path. So again, there's additions to the Quran, uh, developed teachings and sayings about the Sana. Kind of reminded me of, you know, when we talk about Eastern Orthodox and even Roman Catholicism, uh, some of these were even Judaism, where you start adding to the original, the original works. And, you know, in a way, the Bible was kind of like that because we had many different authors, you know, but still... Um, you know, there once it was written down, you know, we haven't expounded upon them, but um, but they comprise, you know, our Bible, their Quran, again, kind of has a, uh, a number of different entities that go into it. Now, this uh, Sunnah became the foundational basis for traditions built on Muhammad's con conduct as a prophet, as well as how he managed things while being a guide, judge, ruler of Muslim followers. Now, I don't know how Muslims really feel about it, but, you know, here again, it seems like he was given a vision, now things are being added on to it. And, uh, you know, the very end of Revelation says, you know, anyone who adds to this book, name will be erased from, you know, the book of life. He's talking about Revelation. He's basically talking about people who would, you know, deliberately disrupt what John had to say. And I don't think any Christian would do that. But um, no, the Bible, we hold on to it. We, uh, we don't add to it like Eastern Orthodox. We don't add, you know, like Catholicism, you know, other church traditions that's, you know, we, we bring into our theology. The Sunna were gathered into one body of work called the Hadith, which supplements the Quran. Okay, so there's the two bodies of work, kind of like Judaism, really. Okay, where they have the Torah, but then they have other works as well. Islam is much the same thing. So they've got uh, the Quran, but then they have other bodies of work called the Hadith. So those are supplements to the Quran. Now, the uh, Sharia, Okay, is another important source of Islamic teaching. You have to hear Sharia law. Okay, the Sharia is a combination of legal interpretations of the Quran and the Sunnah. Sharia means law and sets the parameters for a strict lifestyle of Muslim living. Okay, so the, these are laws, the rules in which Muslims are to live by. It sets the parameters for a strict lifestyle. Okay, and they call this, and we hear it oftentimes on the news, we've heard this, you know, Sharia law, someone being punished under Sharia law. Now, the Sharia sets guidelines against eating pork and drinking alcoholic beverages. The Sharia also sets punishments for stealing, adultery, apostasy, denying Islam, and blasphemy, saying anything derogatory about Islam or Muhammad. And so they set very harsh punishments on this. And we, you know, even here in the news today, you know, people being punished because 
they broke the Sharia law, something to do with it. So strict uh, Muslims uh, adhere to that very, very strongly. Now, uh, they, they follow what they call the six doctrines of Islam. Yeah, there's six major doctrines, and the, each one of these, every Muslim is required to believe, okay? So one, God, okay, there is only one true God, and his name is Allah. Okay, Allah is all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful, and he's only one entity, okay, and Allah is it. And it's not like biblical Christianity, we believe in the Trinity. They say, no, there's no Trinity. There is one God, his name is Allah. They also do believe in angels. Now, they do believe in Gabriel, who they say is the chief angel. They also believe in Shaitan, which is the he from the Hebrew word Satan, so they feel Satan is a an angel and jinn or jinns they believe are demons so they do believe in a spirit world and angels uh okay uh their scripture uh, there are four holy books okay the muslims believe are god inspired the torah of moses the first five books of the old testaments or we call the pentateuch okay same thing the zabur the psalms of david Angel, the gospel of Jesus, and I'll get back to that in just a second here, and the Quran. Now, as far as you say the gospel of Jesus, they actually believe in the gospel. Well, they believe that the Jews and Christians have corrupted our scriptures and therefore believe the Quran is all of final word to mankind. So they 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 don't take our scriptures literally, they believe that we we corrupted what Jesus said. Well. You know, when you look at uh, historically what Jesus did, who he was, uh, it's just undeniable that a person called Jesus did come on the earth, did die, did resurrect. There's too many eyewitnesses, people who wrote about it at the time. Roman rulers knew about it. We even wrote and told the names of those Roman rulers who witnessed it, which we're going to get into a little bit later tonight. So it's kind of saying, what part of Jesus' words have we corrupted that we really can't prove historically, uh, even uh, through, through ancient, ancient written words? Uh, the earliest transcripts and pieces that we can find. So, you know, okay, well, what, what part has been corrupted? Uh, we don't feel any part has. <laughs> Muhammad, uh, they say, is the last and greatest of the 28 prophets. They include Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, Jonah, and Jesus. But there again, Jesus is a sub-prophet, you might say, of Muhammad. But how can you call Jesus a prophet when he's claiming who he is to be, you know? And so they would probably say, well, he really didn't claim that. Well, might as well throw the whole thing out because that's what the whole New Testament is about. Jesus is God, died for the sins of the world. So when people say, yeah, I don't believe Jesus who is who you think he is, well, I think he's a good person. Well, you're saying two different things. He's lying here, but he's good here. You know, you got to take one or the other. Now, the end times, they believe in end times. They believe the dead will be resurrected on the last day. Okay, Allah will judge each person who then will be sent to heaven or hell. Heaven will be a place of sensual pleasure, and hell will be for those who oppose Allah and his prophet Muhammad. So the, these are their doctrinal beliefs that everyone has to follow. They have to believe. They believe in predestination. Okay, now they believe that God determined what he pleases, and no one can change what is decreed. So this is known as kismet. Some of you may have heard that term before. This is where it comes from, the doctrine of fate. Okay, so from this doctrine, Muslims state the most common Islamic phrase, if it, if it is all is well. You know, maybe we can learn a little bit from that too, you know, thinking, okay, God... Your will be done. You know, I think maybe we can take a little lesson here too. You, okay, God, you know, your will be done. I'm really praying for this. But God, your will be done. You know, John says, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So even in trouble and tribulation, I was talking with someone 
just recently who said that they were praying for a family member and didn't get well and was kind of trying to say, in other words, God doesn't exist because I prayed and my prayer didn't get answered. Well, you know, God never said he's going to answer every prayer the way we want. Besides what he did say, it is uh, appointed for everyone to die. <laughs> That's a promise. So, you know, when you really think about it, you know, at some point we're going to go. But with a Christian, God will be with us. He'll give us a peace. You know, he'll bring us through whatever trial we need to go through. You know, and that's where we rest our faith in him. And the more we just talk with him and the more we just, you know, read his word and just the more we meditate on his goodness, then some, sometimes those things we prayed so hard about, we can let go and say, God, it's in your hands. You know, it, it's it's your will. I'm doing it. You know, I think that I've, I've, I've had this happen before, and I imagine you have too, whereby you sometimes you just pray and you pray and pray and pray. And you just never stop because you, something is so much on your heart. And God even says, you know, he gives the parable about the person who keeps knocking on the door and won't let the, the housekeeper sleep until the guy finally answers it. But then there's other times where I feel that I felt like God said, you know, some you can stop now. I've heard the prayer. You just stop. You don't need to ask anymore. I know your heart. Just kind of relax now and, and let me take over. So that's kind of where you know, when we're in tune with God and we're just really working. Sometimes he does tell us, okay, you can stop now. You don't have to work. Sometimes he says, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. You know, so how long do we pray? It's between you and God. You know. Now, the five pillars of faith, okay? So their statement of belief. Now, to become a Muslim, one has to publicly repeat uh, the Shahada. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. So you have to repeat that. That's one of the one of the main pillars of faith. Person has to say, "There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the prophet of Allah." Now, the prayer: Muslims must pray five times a day at daybreak, noon, midday, after sunset, early evening. They must kneel and bow in the prescribed manner in the direction of the holy city, Mecca. And that kind of piqued my interest a little bit. And I thought, well, you know, I, 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 I've i seen people that I believe are Muslims. And I don't remember them at noontime doing this or whatever. So I kind of looked it up a little bit. Well, some take liberty. Some don't do it five times a day. Some will do it once. Some don't do it at all. <laughs> some will do it twice. So there's kind of a, I guess, a different little bit of liberty depending on uh who the uh, muslim is but basically five times alms they must give one fortieth of their profit 2.5 percent the offering goes to widows orphans the sick and others in need so they do believe in alms yeah. ramadan a lot of us have heard this may have had friends or neighbors or something who practice ramadan it's the ninth month of the Islamic year. Okay, now I don't think I put this next one in your notes. Did I? This commemorates? I don't think you have that. Okay, um, th this uh, Ramadan, uh, what it is, it's the ninth month, and what it does, it commemorates when the Quran was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. It's the highest of the Muslim holy seasons, and Muslims must fast the entire month from sunrise the sunset. Well, you got to do that for a month. I mean, that, that's that's tough. You know, that that would be kind of too rough. But they they take the Ramadan very seriously, and they say that's the month that the Quran was revealed to Muhammad. Now, you don't have this slide either, because you see the secret code up there. Okay. Uh, now, you'll see their symbol and their flag here. The crescent moon signifies the beginning of Ramadan. Uh, it's a symbol of Islam, and you know I was doing some research on this, and there doesn't seem to be any what I came up with any one real definitive reason for the crescent moon. In fact, uh, some say that this symbol uh, has occurred uh, many, many years, possibly ahead of uh, Islam, for different meanings. But it may have come from the Ottoman leader Osman, 
when he conquered Constantinople. We talked about that. Remember when we talked about Eastern Orthodox, when um, Constantine in 315, three, or, or 515, 517, right around in there, uh, moved the capital to Constantinople. And so when Osman, the Ottoman leader, he was a Muslim, he conquered Constantinople in 1453. So, uh, and the symbol of Constantinople, they did have the crescent moon. So some, of the, some theories are is that when Osman came in and took Constantinople, he kept that symbol now as himself, showing that he was now the owner of, uh, of that flag. And then the five pointed star, Again, I couldn't find anything really definitive on this, but some people feel it might represent the five pillars of Islam that we just went over. So the crescent moon, the five stars, that's kind of one of their symbols. Uh, the crescent moon also, uh, like I said here, is the beginning uh, of Ramadan. So whenever the, the, the Ramadan begins, usually the moon is literally in, in a crescent that, start, that starts it. Now, pilgrimage to Mecca, and there's that, that temple right there in the middle. Uh, this pilgrimage is called the Hajj and must be performed at least once in a Muslim's lifetime. If, however, the pilgrim is, pilgrimage is too difficult or dangerous, they can send someone in their place. So that's uh, another one of their motives here, the, the pilgrimage. Now, how the Quran uh, contradicts the Bible. Kind of interesting here. So we're talking about similarities and differences all here. Now, Muslims trace their ancestry to Ishmael, the son of Abraham. We read this in Genesis 16 and 21. So if you kind of look at the chart here, you see for uh, Abraham, then from his uh, maidservant, um, uh, Ishmael was born. And from Ishmael, the Ishmaelites or the Arabs. Okay, that's they so they trace their lineage through Ishmael up to Abraham. Now the Jews, the Israelites, trace their lineage up from Jacob uh, up to Jacob through Isaac to Abraham. So they both have this common bond right here. So right off the bat, in the beginning of the Islamic world and the very beginning of Judaism and Christianity, you have one man, Abraham. And right from Abraham, you have the two splits. This is what I kind of mentioned, my Mervinism, my little prophecy thing that it's only I came up with, so don't take it literally. But I just feel the end time battle that you read in Ezekiel 38, 39 uh, is going to be, uh, I think, between the Muslims and the Jews. I think it's going to go back to these two groups. And I think that's what it's going to be. And personally, my belief, I think, because we're not going to be here, there's going to be massive war, massive devastation. There's going to be natural phenomena, like, a, you know, different things. I, I think Western Hemisphere is going to be out of the, the equation. Personally, I think China and Russia is going to be out of the equation. We're talking about this final battle. And I, I it's my thinking that the world is going to, come down to that Mediterranean Middle East era where you're going to have the battle between Ishmael and uh, 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 Jake uh, and Isaac, you know. So that's a Mervinism. Okay, so <laughs> can erase it, whatever you want. Throw it out the window. But interesting to think, you know, the Bible doesn't say things real clear. The ones who's going to know exactly what's going to happen are those who go through the tribulation and come to know the Lord and read the Bible. They're going to get it. But since it's not real clear, then I think I'm very legal to have Mervinisms. Okay. <laughs> now, similarities. Okay, again, Muslims trace their ancestries to Ishmael. Uh, Muslims believe, Muslim beliefs about the nature of God, uh, the resurrection of the body, and judgment. That's very similar to the Bible. Uh, Revelation at the end says, uh, that final judgment, now that final judgment we call the great white throne judgment, is going to be judging non-believers. We are not going to be part of that. We have already been given our rewards. We're not going to be judged for anything bad because they're going to be burned out. That, that they were taken care of when we accepted Christ as our Savior. So our judgment will be a judgment for rewards. 
the great white throne judgment is going to be a judgment to non-believers. And for everyone whose book, name is not written in the book of life, they're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. That's what Revelation says. Well, they have a similar belief in that, that there's going to be a judgment. Now, the differences between the Quran and the Bible. The Quran teaches God is one, and they do not allow for the Trinity. They feel anyone who ascribes partners to God is committing the sin of shirk, sure, blasphemy. Okay, so they, they would not take the Trinity. Muslims believe Allah is uh, transcendent, all-powerful, and relatively impersonal. Now, this is a big difference now between uh, Islam and uh, biblical Christianity. Muslims do not ascribe the name of father to God, since this would convey a father and son relationship. The Bible and Jesus' teaching states God is our personal heavenly father. So let's start getting into some scripture. Mark 14, and he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not I, my will, but your will be done. Look at Romans, for you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out the same words Jesus used, Abba, Father. So we have the same connection to our Heavenly Father that Jesus had. Pretty amazing. Now, Jesus was God. Uh, you ask me, how did that happen? I don't know. We'll ask him that when we get to heaven. But we have the right to use the same word to God that G Jesus used, Abba. So talking about personal, we believe in a personal God, and they believe that theirs is a very impersonal. Uh, Muslims refer to God as the merciful, but he is not viewed primarily as a dispenser of love and underlined grace but more as a righteous judge to whom the Muslims must give account. Now, I won't ask you any of you to say this, but the, do you know the difference of mercy and grace? When you think about it, hmm, that's it, mercy and grace. Okay, I'm really glad you asked. A good definition of this, again, you don't have this, uh, and I thought that'd be interesting to throw in. Uh, and I found this definition, I think it's really good. Grace is stopping a judgment. So in other words, when Christ died on the cross, he gave us grace because he paid for our sins. Mercy comes after grace. It's a blessing that's given after. So he stopped us from dying in our sins. He washed away. But then what did he do? Under mercy, he gave us his Holy Spirit. He gave us his word. He's given us eternal life. Okay, this is it, you know, so someone might uh, be given mercy by a judge and not be given a jail sentence, but the judge might be given grace, that is, by stopping a jail sentence where the judge might give mercy and help this person get a job, a place to live or something. So you can think of that, right? grace is stopping a judgment, mercy is the blessing that's given after stopping of a judgment. So they believe that God is merciful, but uh, not really a dispenser of love and grace. The Bible teaches both God's greatness and his love. We see his greatness. This is how a biblical Christian feels about God. It says, then I said, it is my grief that the right hand of the Most High has changed. I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. Surely, David is saying, I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on your work and muse on your deeds. So if God wasn't loving, why would David have been musing on the works of God? Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? That's the song we sing. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your strength among the peoples. You have made, have, uh, have by your power redeemed your people. Redeem is to buy us back. The sons of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. Look at Isaiah. From eternity, I am he, and there is none who can deliver out of my hand. I act and who can reverse it. God is speaking here in the book of Isaiah. Um, is showing again, not only his love, but his all power. So his greatness. God's love, we see his love here in a lot of scripture. It says, but because the Lord loved you, he kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers. The Lord brought you out by a mighty hand, redeemed you from the house of slavery, 
uh, but Moses is talking to the people of the children of Israel who was brought out of Egypt from the hand of Pharaoh. Jeremiah, and this is talking about future uh, revelation after Jesus' second coming and Israel is, is, Israel is restored in the land. It says, the virgin will rejoice in the dance and the young men and the old together, for I will turn their mourning into joy and I'll comfort them and give them joy for their sorrow. See, we believe that God is a God of joy. He's a God of dancing. He wants us to, you know, enjoy him, his presence and his blessings. Ephesians, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he has loved us. Okay, not only does he just save us from sins, but he, he gives us a spirit to save us from just troubles in life, to give us wisdom, his godly wisdom. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called the children of God. So we can use Abba, Father, and, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. See the difference here of the two religions. So one is a judgmental God and maybe um, uh, a God of mercy to an extent, but the God we serve, it goes way beyond that. Let's just call him Daddy, Abba, is really what that is, it's like a child would say to his dad. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. See, we look at God as a God of love. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. We're very different here in theology. Now, uh, the Quran denies Jesus as the Son of God, but does describe the virgin birth in a passage similar, similar to Luke. Now, in the Quran, they have chapters called Surah. So, uh, in the Quran, it'd be Surah 3, 45 through 47. Um, but we have Luke, chapter 1, 26 to 38, which talks, I won't read the whole thing. Well, I guess I shortened it, didn't I? It says, now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. to virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Okay, so we both kind of believe, uh, describe the virgin birth. The Quran refers to Jesus as a prophet, similar to Abraham, Jonah, and others. However, Muslims place Jesus below Muhammad, again in the Surah 4171. Now, the Muslims do not recognize what the New Testament says about Jesus' divinity. So let's, let's look. They believe that Jesus was just a prophet, that he's below Muhammad. So what do Christians believe about Jesus? Okay. And they cried out saying, what business do we have uh, with each other? These are the demons, son of God. Have you come here to torment us before the time? See, Muslims believe in jinns, demons. So in our scripture, it's even the, saying that the demons are giving God, Jesus the title, son of God, which is, would be his divine name. And Matthew, when he was still speaking, Jesus, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice he said, this is my beloved son of whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now, son doesn't mean a biological son. It means inheritor, uh, uh, one of divine quality. Now, uh, divine quality, son of God, means, uh, again, um, from God, of God, divine. So who is divine? Only God is divine. So if Jesus... This is divine name than Jesus, and he's divine. He's got to be God. Uh, now, um, in the beginning was the word. So Jesus was in the beginning, and this means in the word beginning means before anything was Jesus. And Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. I mean, you can't be more clear what Jesus is saying about himself here. So when people say, yeah, I think he is good, but I don't believe, you know, he's uh, who he said he is. Well, you know, then you got to say he's not very good, is he? Who would say things like this and be really good? Uh, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, I am is Yahweh, the, the word that they wanted to even say out loud. It was so holy to them of the Old Testament. So, gee, that, that remember, that's what God said to Moses and saying who, who he is, I am. So Jesus takes the exact same name that God gives to Moses and saying, this is my name. So you can imagine why the Jews are a little bit upset. Uh, how about this one? I and the Father are one. Okay. Jesus said to them, have I been so long with you and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? Who has, he who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? 
Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. He is the, again, Paul says, Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So in other words, he's with God before anything. So if, how, if, how could Christ be created if he was before creation? It doesn't work that way. So it means he was before, he couldn't have been created because he's before creation. So for by him, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. I kind of like reading all of these passages because taking one or two, yeah, yeah, yeah. But all of a sudden you hit three, four or five saying all these powerful things. At least in my mind, I start saying, yeah, this kind of, I get what he's saying here. Jesus is God, isn't it? Um, now, Muslims feel Christians have changed the Bible to add the above, above references. Well, gee, if we're going to take out whatever we think has been corrupted there's not going to be any bible left you know because the whole thing is about jesus being god and what he did for us the quran states christ never really died on. i like this one the quran states christ never really died on the cross but that god took him to heaven before the crucifixion now i've got some verses about this here so just kind of hang on uh about him not really dying now muslims say judas died on the cross or possibly Simon of Cyrene, and was made up to fool Jesus' followers. Yeah, that's not Jesus up there. That's Judas. See, look at him. You can tell. Now, some Muslims feel Jesus was taken from the cross before death and was later revived. And we're going to talk about this, too. Now, to a Christian, the cross is the central point of salvation. There were eyewitness accounts of his crucifixion. So for any religion to come and say, no, it really wasn't Jesus on the cross, or no, he really wasn't dead, some, or no, he was really hanged rather than being on the cross. Uh, I'm not going to quote these. I want to go through Matthew 27. Let's see if any of that holds up true. Let's see who were the ones who witnessed this. Okay, I'm going to be jumping all over Matthew 27. Then the soldiers, so they're the first group, of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. So we know soldiers saw him, the Roman soldiers. Now, when Matthew wrote this book, okay, these, a lot of these people were still living. The Roman government was still in power. These words are being spread through the Roman Empire. If this was totally fictitious, these words wouldn't have made it out the front door. Something had to happen. There's no real refutation against this. So the soldiers come in, the whole Roman cohort saw them, and then they, they, meaning the soldiers, Roman soldiers, came to a place called Golgotha, which means a place of the skull. And when they, the soldiers, crucified him, so they knew who they were getting, the, Jesus was uh, taken to them. They didn't switch characters suddenly. They divided up his garments among themselves. They cast lots. They sat down and watched them. So suddenly we didn't swap bodies. They didn't see him swinging on a rope. These are Roman soldiers that are being documented here in the writings of Matthew. And they even put above his head, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Now, Romans didn't make mistakes like this. They, they didn't hang the wrong guy up on the, the, the cross. Uh, they didn't write the wrong man's name up on this. Then who else saw it? Robbers who had been crucified and were insulting him. Then the book goes on and say, I mean, how absurd would this be to write if this kind of thing didn't happen? And people were living at the time that these things were being, or at least the second generation of this, the sixth hour darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour, and the veil of the temple was torn. Now the priests are witnessing this. These are Jewish priests, okay? They're witnessing this from the top to the bottom. The earth shook, the rocks were split, and the tombs were open. Now, not only that, many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Now, I know one thing. If I was living at that time, I would not make up this story and spread it around the Roman Empire and actually point fingers at Roman soldiers who did this, and even talk about Pilate, the one and the other Roman uh, rulers who were in on this. 
Uh, I wanted to have lived a very long to even finish my sentence here. So something had to have happened for, for this to have been spread. And then uh, uh, 300 years later, suddenly Christianity becomes the religion of the Roman Empire. Okay, the, the things like that doesn't happen on the fiction. Okay, now it says, now the centurion, okay, who was there keeping the guard over Jesus, saw the earthquake, said, truly, this was the son of God. And then who else were witnessing? Many women were looking from the distance and they, it names it, okay? When it was evening, we have a rich man now, Joseph of Arimathea, and he goes to Pilate. The, Matthew, the writer, names Pilate, the person there who asked for the body of Jesus. He's chronicling all these things out. They're being duplicated. They're being spread around the Roman world. And then the chief priests are in on it. And then the Pharisees are in it. He has named so many people that if none of this happened, I think one of them would have written a short article about it, at least. You know, uh, th This kind of thing is really hard to refute. When you look at the logic, uh, therefore gave orders for the grave to be secured. Okay, now, see, this is another thing. Look what happened here. Therefore, he gave orders uh, the, for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away. So they knew he was dead. Why would they even say, hey, let's secure the tomb so his disciples can't steal him away? So it's just hard to refute just the logic of that. Now, uh, Jesus died as a ransom. Let's see here. Let me go back here. Okay, this or uh, I need to really hurry. Jesus predicted his death many times. Uh, you see here another thing. Uh, from that time, he began to show his disciples. He says, I'm going to suffer many things, be killed and raised up. Now, if a prophet's words does not come true, you don't listen to the prophet. Did his words come true? Yes, they're written down. And it happened exactly as he said. Now, Matthew 27 says, states Jesus died on a rope, not on a cross. Well, here we have in Matthew 27, what he does, it says, we see, it names the people. It goes into the temple sanctuary. You know, he threw it to the chief priests and the elders. He goes out and he hangs himself. So here we have too many witnesses to refute what uh, uh, Islam is trying to say, that this didn't happen. Uh, Muslims believe in the order to earn salvation from sin, you must follow these five pillars of faith, which we've talked about a few pages, I think, back. Um, now, the Bible teaches that one obtains salvation through the forgiveness of sins, through faith, not through the five pillars of faith, not through doing any acts, just faith, simple faith in Jesus. All one has to say is, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Take me, I'm yours. You don't have to even say those exact words. He knows your heart. You just give yourself to Jesus. Ask him to forgive you. And you're a son. You don't have to go through five pillars of faith. You don't have to do uh, trips to some holy place. You don't have to bow down so many times. It's so simple. And it says, and there's salvation. But for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, you know, to die for us. Uh, there's no other name under heaven whereby we may be saved. For all have sinned. See, some religions don't believe that we are born in sin. Uh, Eastern Orthodox is the same way. Uh, but no, it says all have sinned. You all need a savior. But because of his great love, see the difference of it, the biblical Christianity's God and the Islam's God. We believe ours is a God of extreme love. So much that we're to call him Abba, Father. Now, um, Christianity does not place undue burdens on a person. Look what Matthew says. You start, you start doing all these comparisons. Are you noticing something common? Works, 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 works. Look at Chris, Matthew 7. Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened. I'm going to give you rest, not works, rest. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, our minds don't comprehend this kind of thing. We're used to vengeance. We're used to getting back at person, a person. We're used to getting our own way. We're used to, you know, uh, the harder you work, the more you earn, uh, the, the, this whole thing here. Uh, so when we 
is to hear things like this, we think, no, no, I got to work. I got to do something. And the Bible says, no, you don't. Now, loving in the West and oppressive in the East. A distinction does need to be made between the friendly image of Islam projected in the West, though we're getting more influence of the East coming in, and the uncompromising and political nature of Islam in the East. Uh, Islam of Islamic countries, by and large, believe if Islam is to be practiced correctly, then all of society must submit to uh, Sharia law. Um, because of this belief, everyone in Islamic society, not here in the U.S., but in Islamic society, including non-Muslims, must either conform to Islamic laws, economics, politics, customs, or suffer very heavy consequences. This is actually contrary to the Quran, which teaches that there should be no compulsion to religion, Surah 1099, interesting enough. Islamic law is very strict. I've circled here in red. The ones that are really strict. Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan. Well, the more tolerant ones are the two little ones in the black circle, uh, Qatar and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, their uh, Islamic law uh, kind of depends the region you're in. Might be a little, very, very strict or a little bit more relaxed. Islam in the West is very different from Islam in Muslim-dominated countries. Um, one of the re reasons is Muslims in the West live in a democratic country, entitled to all benefits and privileges. Muslims in the West are protected as a minority religious group. The civil liberties are secure. They may practice the religion freely. And so we see a very mild form of it, at least so far here in the West. You don't have this. Now, I, since he wrote the book, we've heard several groups come up. So I wanted to put this in. ISIS. Okay, what is ISIS? So this is something that, you know, we've been hearing about. The Islamic, is the Islamic State or ISIS is a militant organization that emerged as an offshoot of Al-Qaeda. Now, Al-Qaeda was um, is, uh, is, is an Islamic shoot. It was... Uh, um, developed really over here in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, and uh, uh, um, Osama bin Laden, he was the, the leader of that, of the Al Qaeda movement that really developed in that region over there. And its goal was to basically spread Islam worldwide. Well, ISIS is an offshoot of that. And it quickly, and it's much more ra radical, uh, and it quickly took control of large parts of now moving west uh, of Iraq, and East, I've got it circled here, and Syria. So we're seeing ISIS now develop from Al-Qaeda, more of the east of Iran, to ISIS more in the west here of Iran, raising its black flag, like the picture there, and declaring the creation of a caliphate. A caliphate is a would be a re religious ruler who would be technically would be a religious world ruler is what they want of Islam. But it's a religious, it's a, a religious ruler uh, imposing strict Islamic rule. And so these are kind of groups that came up since uh, our book was written. Uh, sometimes a group is referred to as ISIL. You may have heard that sometimes on the news for the Islamic State of Iraq. And the Levant. The Levant is an area I've got in my red circle here, kind of uh, uh, that that region I have circled, the kind of Syria there, uh, Iraq uh, region, uh, kind of call that area the Levant, uh, uh, or by its a uh, Arabic acronym Daesh. Okay, um, so ISIL, Daesh. Um, sometimes you'll you'll hear that or ISIS. It is largely made up of Sunni militants from Iraq and Syria, but has also drawn thousands of fighters from across the Muslim world in Europe. So we're seeing this grow. Uh, it was really crushed down quite a bit um, uh, during the uh, uh, to 2016 to 2020, right around in there. But now it's kind of been really stringing up back again. 
uh, become very strong. Its tactics, including beheadings, the taking of slaves, banning, bans on un-Islamic behavior, such as movies, smoking, so brutal that it was even disowned by Al-Qaeda. So it's much more militant than Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden was promoting. Um, the militant's goal is an ultra-conservative ultra caliphate that strictly enforces Sharia law. Now, ISIS was found by this guy, uh, phonetically, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, D-A-D-D-Y, yeah, Abu, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, an Iraqi. And so he was really the founder of ISIS, very militant. Now, real quick, let me go through the black Muslims. I said, this is a lot of history here, but there's so many offshoots that I think it's worth going over. Who are they? What were they? An American ad adaptation of Islam is founded in the black Muslim movement. Timothy Drew in 1913 taught that black, blacks were originally from Morocco, that's Western Af Northwest Africa, not from Eastern Africa, from Ethiopia. They've been enslaved by the Caucasian devil, Drew changed his name to Noble Drew Ali and called for the overthrow of the tyranny of the white culture. In 1919, after Ali died, Wallace Ford Muhammad claimed to be Ali reincarnated and formed the Nation of Islam in Detroit in 1930. Okay. After 1935, Elijah, Elijah Muhammad assumed the leadership of the movement. Elijah Muhammad taught that a mad black scientist created whites uh, they would rule the earth for 6,000 years. <laughs> now, he felt that 1914, which was, if you remember, the beginning of World War I in Europe, had ended that 6,000-year rule, and Blacks are now supposed to unite and bring sanity to the world. Hmm. During the 1960s, a lot, a lot of you remember this, not me. I I I, I wouldn't remember this. I was way way too young. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, during the sixties and seventies, the nation of Islam grew rapidly as Elijah focused on strict discipline and on um, bettering the education of black people while improving their economic and political conditions. So we remember that quite a bit during those uh, decades. During the fifties and sixties, Malcolm X. A leader in the nation of Islam began moving away from Elijah Muhammad's positions and teachings, and he followed the multiracial characteristics of Orthodox Sunni Islam, but was assassinated by Black Muslims in 1965. Uh, by the 70s, Black nationalism was disavowed by Black Muslim leaders and non-Black members were now suddenly being admitted. So we were having a change in their tactics and policy. Elijah's son, Wallace D. Muhammad, took over after Elijah died and then changed the name to American Muslim Mission. This movement relaxed the strict discipline and harsh rhetoric of the Black Muslim movement. And remember the sport figures, Muhammad Ali and you know, uh, different ones, you know, who are kind of going into the Black Muslim movement. Um, other Black Muslims objected to Wallace's policies, and then Louis Farrakhan resurrected again the Nation of Islam in, in 78 and taught the principles of Black separatism. His uh, racist statements are considered un Islamic by Orthodox Muslims. So we're getting a lot of offshoots of the Black. Muslim camp here. Now, reasons for Western tolerance of Islam. A major reason why Islam is tolerated here in America is because of our Judeo-Christian heritage. Provides theological foundation for the dignity of each person's freedom of conscience and choice. So I won't have to look at all these verses here, but basically it is because of our Judeo-Christian heritage that we really have the freedoms that we have. So summing up the differences regarding God, Muslims believe there is no God but Allah, while Christians believe God is revealed in Scripture as Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the three persons in one. These are great scriptures. We don't have time to go through them, but they're really good. Uh, regarding Jesus Christ, Muslims believe Jesus was only a man, who being only a man was below Muhammad in importance and did not die for man's sins. But uh, then Christians believe Christ is the son of God 
who died and rose again for mankind. Um, regarding sin, Muslims believe humans are born without sin, same as uh, Eastern Orthodox do Judaism. Uh, again, uh, Eastern Orthodox Judaism, Islam, don't believe in uh, original sin, being born into sin. If a person sins, the sin can be overcome by acts of will. Christians believe we are born uh, corrupted by sin, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Scripture says. Um, and apart from God's grace, no one uh, does good. Apart from faith, no one can be saved. Um, regarding salvation, Muslims say Allah does not love those who do wrong, and each person must earn their salvation. So Allah doesn't love those who do wrong. But look, 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 look what Christians believe, what, what God does. But God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were sinners, he died for us. A complete 180 there. He loves the sinner. He died for us. Okay, he died for us according to the scripture. Very loving God. In means in. <laughs> okay, so that ended it. Uh, so uh, wrap it all up. What does this all tell us? Well, I think it's telling us a lot of things. We're seeing uh, faith after religion after religion after religion. A common thing. Works, works, works. You got to be good enough. Got to be good enough. The question is, when is good enough good enough? That's the, the quandrum that you always will get into. And God says, you will never be good enough. I've taken it from you. Accept me by faith. Ask me to forgive you of your sins. Take me into your life. And it's a done deal. Now, after that, yes, we become, that's justification. Just if I had never sinned. That's what justification is. He makes it so we've never sinned. Now we become sanctified, meaning we mature in Christ, not to uh, gain his favor. We've already gained it. But we mature to become more like him because as we become more like him, then he gives us the grace. He gives hope. He gives us peace. He gives us the uh, security of eternal uh, salvation. He gives us, you know, comfort. He gives us guidance, wisdom. So, no, we don't work. Okay, once we've been forgiven, we're forgiven. When we sin, do we go asking for forgiveness? No, it's already forgiven. We repent. It means, oh, sorry, God, I, I'm not doing that one again. We turn and stop doing it. But we're already forgiven. Okay, so let's pray. Father, thank you for making our gospel so simple. It's so free. It's not a burden. Your yoke is easy. And it's a hard concept for us to understand because we're not wired that way mentally. We think we have to earn favor. And uh, I pray that your grace would just be real to us, that we'll understand how much you do love us and we can rest in you, that you have us in your will. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.